Leningrad Documentary Film Studios. Maxim Gorky, Years and Days. Commissioned by the USSR State Television and Radio Broadcasting Committee. Script, Taisia Janssen, Direction, Irina Kalinina. Camera, Yuri Nikolaev. Maxim Gorky writing to Romain Roland. It would be wonderful to go with you down the Volga and the Kama River to the Euros. There are excellent ships in the Volga. I could tell you a good deal about the past history of towns in the Volga. We would experience wonderful days with you, my dear friend. Gorky was born and raised on the Volga and said he hailed from the north and the Volga. It is from the banks of that river that the days and years start of Alexei Maximovich Gorky, a great Russian and Soviet writer. He is already 60 and hasn't been in his home country for almost seven years. Moscow welcomed Gorky home on May 28, 1928. For these people, he was not only their favorite writer, he was a living legend, proclaiming the new world they were building. Among those welcoming him are people's commissars Clement Voroshilov and Anatoly Lunacharsky. the happiest days of my life. I don't know whether anywhere or at any time a writer had been welcomed by his readers with such friendship and such joy. This joy has stunned me. I didn't recognize the city. I recognized the houses, but the people have changed. Young people and so much building going on. The days and weeks flew by filled with meetings and discoveries. Gorky's son, Maxim, his closest friend, returned with him from Italy. In the remaining years, they were inseparable. Gorky dreamed of traveling through the country of visiting places which he had walked through at one time years ago when he was young. Those years of wandering had provided him with a great deal of observations of life. In 1892, a Tiflis newspaper in Georgia published his first story called Makar Chudra, which he signed with his pen name of Maxim Gorky. The Volga at last. Once again, his hometown of Nizhny Novgorod, where he was born on March 28, 1868, and spent his childhood. My memory brought me back to other days, other games and pastimes. My thoughts keep returning to the distant past. A 
Alexei learned to read and write as a youngster, and possibly it was books that gave him a glimmer of hope to see a better life for the people and to see them become better. He was orphaned as a boy and lived with his grandparents. It was a large and quarrelsome family. Only my grandmother became my friend for life, closest to my heart. It was her unselfish love for the world that enriched me, filling me with strength for a working life. He started working when he was 10. He swept yards, was a gardener, stevedore, and baker, ran errands in stores, and caught and sold birds. He lived among these people, those who were social outcasts, tramps, thieves, and rowdies. He worked with them at the docks, sat by their bonfires, and slept with them on rafts. Years later, they were destined to become the heroes in his early stories, and with them he would start on his literary career, which would earn him prominence in Russia and the world. Today this city is named after him, and the people of Nizhny Novgorod, whom he dearly loved, are now the citizens of Gorky, and they are proud of their great son and revere his memory. All this will come later, but today Nizhny Novgorod awaits him, the city where he lived nearly half of his life. He visited the marketplace, which was so similar to and yet so different from what he remembered when he was here as a reporter. He also visited the Sormova plant, for the heroes of his novel Mother came from here. He spent several hours in the radio laboratory. It seemed that everything had been confused, but that everything was right here next to him. met in his hometown in 1901. I am completely absorbed by Shalapin. Shalapin is something grand, astonishing, and so Russian. A semi-illiterate cobbler and lathe operator, he passed through the thorny path of humiliation to reach the heights surrounded with glory. But he managed to remain a simple and sincere man. He gave a concert here donating the proceeds to the People's Theatre. He lived a long life, no less than I. He had seen a lot, no less than I. Two great talents, two gems. Each in his own way expressed the times and the immense inner strength of the people and their hopes. In those years at the turn of the century, after years of wanderings, Gorky's life seemed to settle down. He now had a home and a family. A young wife, Yekaterina Pavlovna, 
and a young son, Maxim. Jokingly, the happy father, secretly self-satisfied, would speak of him as his main creation. Gorky's large apartment becomes something of a club. Various events of Russian life are discussed and half the town's population can be seen here. Guests arrive from afar and some stay for weeks. Sometimes Gorky is driven to appeal to his guests, beseeching them. In China, there's a custom for guests to arrive, stay a while and then to leave. The young writer's popularity grew rapidly. His Song of the Falcon, Former People, and Foma Gordzeev had already been published. Gorky becomes an exponent of the revolutionary moods of the poor, the working class, and progressive intellectuals. In 1901, he was arrested and sent to jail, causing dissatisfaction throughout the country. In his newspaper, Iskra, Lenin protested against the persecution of the prominent writer, well known throughout Europe. All of reading Russia, whether in sympathy or hostility, kept their eyes on that teasing name, Maxim Gorky. The great Leo Tolstoy appraised the talent of this young writer. To tell you the truth, it was an expressible joy to see my name on a card next to the line of Russian literature. I'm terribly proud of that. But those years stand out for his friendship with Chekhov. What you wrote me, Anton Pavlovich, is wonderful and right to the point. You are quite right concerning my fanciful words. I just can't seem to get them out of my vocabulary. And then it bothers me that I'm afraid of becoming crude. I'm self-taught. I'm 30 years old. They wrote each other frequently, and then fate brought them both to the Crimea. Chekhov was already seriously ill, and the doctors did not permit him to remain in Moscow. He lived in Yalta. Gorky also arrived in the Crimea for treatment for his lungs, a sickness that would be with him to the end of his days. They did a great deal of walking, talking, and arguing. Gorky admired Chekhov's talent and his ability to awaken in people a revulsion for a somnolent and inert way of life. However, for himself, he envisioned a different goal, convinced that the time had come for heroism, giving society active and courageous people. That spring, the Moscow Art Theater came to the Crimea to show Chekhov, who was very ill, their production of his Seagulls and Uncle Vanya. And that is how Gorky met Maria Andreeva, an actress with the theater. Later, she recalled that during the intermission, there was a knock on her dressing room door, and Chekhov asked permission to enter, saying he was not alone, that Gorky was with him. I was so excited. Goodness, Chekhov and Gorky together. Chekhov came in, followed by a tall, thin figure in a Russian summer shirt with long, straight hair and thick, reddish whiskers. Could that be Gorky, I wondered. On the theater's request, Gorky wrote the play, The Philistines. In 
A big social event was the theater's production of his play At the Bottom, placing Gorky firmly on the list of names in Russian and world literature as a playwright. Gorky left his hometown of Nizhny Novgorod in 1904. He now lived in Moscow and Petersburg, and often met the painter Repin, the critic Stasov, and many young artists and writers. His public activities now take up a good deal of his time. He becomes head of the Znanya Publishing House and works closely with such realist authors as Andreev, Bunin, and Kuprin. His Song of the Falcon and Song of the Stormy Petrel became poetic declarations of the first Russian Revolution. On the morning of January 9th, 1905, Gorky saw how the Tsar's soldiers fired at a peaceful demonstration of workers. The night following that bloody Sunday, he wrote his appeal, in which he accused the government of mass murder. Three days later, he was arrested and imprisoned in the Peter and Paul Fortress. However, Russian and world public pressure forced the government to reluctantly release Gorky on bail. The authorities are showing an obvious desire to catch me. I don't have any desire to be in jail, and that is why I'm going abroad for a long time and won't return till a new constitution appears. Gorky and his second wife, Maria Andreeva, spent many years abroad. In the autumn of 1906, they settled down in Italy. Gorky was known here, and his plays were staged in many theaters. He lived on the Isle of Capri, where there was lots of sunshine, a beautiful landscape, and wonderful people. Every page of his Tales of Italy is replete with sympathy for these poor, kind, and optimistic people. written so willingly and so easily, and my entire life is in that. I write a good deal and will write still more, something characteristic of me and beneficial. The first Russian Revolution was defeated, but Gorky is certain the struggle will continue. He completed his novel, Mother, the first literary work depicting the struggle of the revolutionary proletariat for socialism. He also wrote The Life of Matvei Kozhemyakin, The Confession, and Childhood, which he dedicated to his son. They live far from each other and do not see each other often. You should write me from time to time, or you'll forget about me. And when I come to you, bald, gray, and bent, you'll ask, who are you? I certainly would like to live with you, and I can imagine how we go down the Volga on a good ship, eating as we go lots of tasty fish, and all that. He keeps thinking of Russia. Capri seems to attract many Russians living far from their country, as though it was a part of their motherland. The devil take it, it's so tempting to get over to you in Capri, Lenin wrote Gorky in 1908 in answer to his invitation. 
You describe everything so wonderfully that, honest to God, I'll certainly come. Lenin and Gorky were acquainted since the Fifth Party Congress in London in 1907. Lenin always spoke highly of Gorky's talent, stressing the importance of his books for the Russian working class movement. However, he invariably pointed out that Gorky was always totally without character in politics and succumbed to various feelings and moods. In Capri, Gorky found himself in the company of people who sharply disagreed with Lenin in their views. Lenin, however, believed that Gorky, as he said, was one of us and will undoubtedly return to us. Gorky was in Petersburg in 1917. This was a difficult time for him, for he doubted that the time was opportune for the revolution. He was tormented by thoughts of the destiny of Russian culture. It was not in his nature, however, to remain idle. He helped in the fight against famine and child delinquency, preserving works of art of historical value and improving the living conditions of scholars and writers. Lenin gave Gorky his sincere support in everything the writer did and Gorky always looked upon Lenin as his friend and teacher for the development of science and culture in the young Soviet Republic. At the same time, Lenin was concerned with the writer's health. In the fall of 1921, when Gorky started coughing blood, Lenin insisted he go abroad for treatment. When he returned several years later, he saw a new country and new people. He wrote to Romain Rolland, When you come to the land of Soviets, you will see that something truly great and important is being accomplished there. You, my dear friend, can imagine my pride and joy. Gorky meets with working people, writers, Red Army men and children. He visits with former delinquents with whom he maintained a correspondence for many years. He looks deeply into their eyes and faces, searching for the face of the new young country. His deteriorating health, however, forced him to return to Sorrento for the winter, where he continued work on his monumental novel, The Life of Klin Samgin, a sweeping work about the difficulties that faced Russian intellectuals. In a letter to Romain Roland, he wrote, My dear friend, I am sending you Samgin. I don't think I have time to make corrections and improvements. Old age is a poor companion in work, and I am certainly aging successfully. Believe me, I am not boasting of this. In Sorrento, he lived happily with his large family, his son, Maxim, and his wife, two grandchildren, Marfa and Daria. Maxim translated his father's books as he knew four languages, typed his manuscripts, and handled the correspondence. Although Gorky lived abroad, he had strong and growing ties with the young Soviet literary world. Yesterday, I received 49 letters and another 62 today. People from home often come to see me. People of different professions. They exude a fragrance of fire and smoke, a healthy aroma. Gorky dreams of returning home for good.
the last years of his life are connected with Moscow. At this time, he is extremely busy, what with his public activities and writing. He is now the central figure in the country's literary world, often writes for the press, and on his initiative, magazines and books are published. Half seriously, he jokes that he is no longer an individual, but a whole office. There are many guests in his house, but his son is no longer with him. He died, giving his whole life to his father. My sincere thanks, dear Alan, for your friendly letter. I don't like and cannot talk about my personal affairs. However, I will say that my son's untimely death has been a bad blow to me. Maxim was a healthy and strong man. He died suffering. But life continued. Gorky tried to be among children often and with his grandchildren, though his busy life left him little time for leisure. He had long been dreaming of uniting all Soviet writers and all cultural workers. And that day finally came when on August 17, 1934, the first Congress of Soviet writers opened. Gorky had brought up a whole generation of young Soviet writers, and he showed a constant concern for the rising generation of writers. He read a good deal of their manuscripts, helping them in their work, believing this to be his real work. The Writers' Congress was an important public event. The party and government have given writers everything, depriving them of only one thing, the right to write badly. To this could be added that the party and government takes from us the right to command each other, giving us the right to teach each other. To teach means a mutual exchange of experience. Only that and nothing more. After the Congress, Gorky again is busy with his novel, Klim Samgin. The work takes him back to the turn of the century, and he has a desire to see his old friends. But their paths have taken different roads. Some are in the country, others live abroad. Gorky writes to Shalapin to return home. Shalapin promises, even starts preparing, but they never do meet again. However, one of the great joys of Gorky's life was his meeting with Romain Roland, with whom he had been corresponding for 20 years and both had been hoping to meet someday. After all, they could not just leave this life without at least seeing each other. And Romain Roland comes to Moscow to visit Gorky. Two great writers, two summits of human spirit two old men. They are both concerned with many problems, literature, art, music, the fate of the world threatened by fascism, and a feeling of approaching catastrophe. As they parted, they agreed to meet again. Six months later, January 1st, 1936, Gorky wrote, 
I walk carefully over this earth, and as a foxy old man, I keep increasing my work so there would be no time to die. I intend living another 20 years, or at least three more. Oh, well then, two more. He died six months later. Immortality? No, thank you. I don't want it. I repeat, blessed be the law of mortality, renovating the days of life. 